This video tells the story of the Day 2 movements in action of Brown's battery. Deployed in a poor position, his battery is overrun. Four guns are captured or disabled during chaos at a break in the wall that becomes known as Brown's Gate. The video is extracted from over 40 hours of animation, covering the entire Gettysburg battlefield on July 1st and 2nd. For more information about this acclaimed work, visit the website referenced above. The 1st Rhode Island Battery B, better known as Brown's Battery, moves towards its initial Day 2 position at Gettysburg, along with Cushing's Battery. They are the two support batteries assigned to Gibbon's 2nd Division of Hancock's 2nd Corps. Commanded by Lieutenant Fred Brown, the battery takes up a position on Cemetery Ridge to the left of Cushing's battery and in front of Gibbon's front-line regiments. They remain in this position, relatively inactive, along with the rest of the 2nd Corps, until late in the afternoon. Shortly after Gibbon dispatched the 15th Massachusetts and the 82nd New York of Harrow's Brigade, forward to the Emmitsburg Road, he orders Brown's battery to a position on their right, atop a mound or small hill. It is clearly visible today when seasonal vegetation does not obscure the topographical features of the landscape. It was about 6 p.m. that they unlimbered at this spot, midway between the Kaderi buildings in the Copse of Trees. In Harry Fonce's book, Gettysburg, The Second Day, he writes, quote, Captain Hazard, commander of the 2nd Corps Artillery, was said to have been apprehensive about the battery's location, and Hancock supposedly disliked it as well. But they accepted Gibbon's decision, and Brown's battery remained down front, unquote. The position was indeed a poor one, about 150 yards downslope in front of Gibbon's main infantry line. Brown was initially deployed facing to the northwest, a good 45-degree angle away from General Wright's approaching Confederate brigade. When the rebels appeared from the west about 30 minutes later, the battery was only able to swing the left four guns to engage the rapidly advancing Confederates. Wright's Brigade of Georgians, in a strong line of skirmishers from Posey's 48th Mississippi, pushed back the Union line of skirmishers west of the Emmitsburg Road. Then they smashed into Gibbon's advanced regiments, the 15th Massachusetts and the 82nd New York, at the Kodori Farm. The remnants of these withdrawing Union units, for the most part, masked the fields of fire for Brown's guns, further exasperating the already subpar position. As the Confederates close in on Brown, he attempts a hectic withdrawal. One gun hesitates to fire one last canister round, point blank, into the charging rebels. That delay results in horses being killed and the gun being overrun and abandoned. Brown is severely wounded, while five guns begin a move back toward a gap in the wall behind which regiments of Hall and Webb are strongly entrenched. Of the five withdrawing guns, two make it through the narrow gap, while two others get jammed up at the wall. The decimated gun crews and horse teams try to clear the jumble of artillery pieces as the fifth gun waits. It too is overrun and abandoned. The gap in the wall becomes known as Brown's Gate. The two guns of Brown's battery that do make it to safety on the east side of the wall, in the process, trample through the 20th Massachusetts. With the opposing infantry lines now fiercely engaged mere yards apart, they take up position just behind that regiment and resume point-blank fire at the 3rd and 48th Georgia regiments. One gun is so close that its muzzle blasts burns the Massachusetts infantrymen in its front. Union firepower is too great from behind the wall, and after 15 minutes or so, 
Wright's left regiments begin to withdraw. They are soon pushed aggressively by a federal countercharge, led by the 106th Pennsylvania, and in the process, all of Brown's guns are recovered. In the growing darkness, Brown's four recovered guns are moved back behind the wall, joining the earlier two. First, the tangled mess of guns and caissons gets sorted out, and three guns traverse the wall through Brown's gate. The last piece is hauled back partway by the infantry until fresh horses arrive and the gun can be limbered up. Brown's battery historian later wrote, quote, Owing to the loss of men and horses, the fifth and sixth pieces were sent to the rear, where the reserve artillery was parked, unquote. Lieutenant Walter Perrin, who has taken over for the wounded Brown, now commands the remaining four guns. They spend the night on Cemetery Ridge and will play a key role in the coming fight on day three. The monument to Brown's battery was dedicated on October 12th, 1886, by the state of Rhode Island. It is located on the eastern side of Hancock Avenue, a few feet to the south across the road from the Copse of Trees. The approximate location of Brown's Gate can be seen on the opposite side of Hancock Avenue from the Battery Monument, between the 59th New York on the left and the Company G 69th Pennsylvania marker on the right. While at the location there appears to be an earthen mound, much has changed since 1863, and the original gate was nothing more than a gap in the stone wall behind which the infantry took cover. Visit our website to register to use this app and explore anywhere, anytime, on the battlefield. www.civilwaranimatedbattles.com